sing hymn number 139 at the cross. Oh, 
or a visitor here, we especially welcome you. If you're joining us from YouTube, watching us live on YouTube, we welcome you then also. We hope one day that you can join us here for the church service on a Sunday morning. I do have a bulletin right here in front of you, if you, in front of me. If you happen to pick one up, I'd like to go over some of the activities that we have here at First Baptist Church. Wednesday night, we have our supper at 5.30. This time, it's going to be soup and sandwiches. Next week is enchiladas and uh, barbacoa is what I heard with homemade tortillas. Is that? No, that's not happening. But it is going to be soup and sandwiches. For supper on Wednesday, October 9th, bring any kind of sandwiches, hot or cold. Bring crock pot full of your favorite soup. Bible study doctrine begins at 6 p.m. with Randy Nupple. Did I say that right? Or Knuppel? All right. That's good. <laughs> I guess. Uh, we're collecting uh, for the Samaritan's Purse shoe boxes. We are collecting this month uh, small notebooks, jump ropes, and small picture books. So make sure that you bring that. Also, remember to uh, bring a dollar per week because to send these gifts out for Samaritan's Purse, we need to pay for the, um, the, the freight to get it over there. I was going to say shipping and handling. We do that part. And we do that free. Uh, finance committee meeting on Tuesday, October 9th at 5.30. And the men's Bible studies on Thursday nights at 6 o'clock. And we also have Mary Hill Davis. The offering goal for this church is $1,000. And um, given to date, we have $300. So please give to our missionaries. Uh, there will be some Mary Hill Davis uh, offertory envelopes. Uh, I don't know if they're set. Are they set in the pews now? Yes, they are. Very good. Also, there's a brochure up in the front foyer if you want to pick one up and that talks about I am Texas Missions, and that is Mary Hill Davis offering. I believe there's a video next that we're going to watch. Randy, I'm so glad we could gather for coffee today. It's been a while since we've been able to catch up. What's going on with you?
ていう。You know, it has been a while, but this is a really exciting time. We are sharing our I am Texas mission stories with the state, and you know, I'm fairly new to WMU of Texas, and I have really been enjoying getting to know Mary Hill Davis.、Mm-hmm. You know, what do you know about Mary Hill Davis? Well, I started learning about Mary Hill Davis as a young adult when I was serving on an associational leadership team while living in Amarillo. And as I began to learn more about her, I just want to share a few things that I、yeah. learned. She was elected the recording secretary for Texas WMU in 1898, and served until she was elected president in 1906. And she served for 25. Five、oh、years,、goodness. and so her legacy and her words are still with us today. And Randy, I I collect quotes, and so I have some quotes on my little ring, and I, I want to share、that. share those with you today. God helps us so grandly and so beautifully mold the young lives that cling to our heartstrings, that the next generation will be a generation of heroes and heroines. In the service of our King. So she was forming the future missionaries and the future leaders.、Mm-hmm, she was. In 1907, she first started Young Women's Auxiliary. Then in 1908, she started RAs. And then 1913, she started GAs. Which for me, as a former GA, a girl who was churched through GA. That really impacts me because I'm thinking of what she did early on impacted my life as a child. I've been reading through a lot of her quotes, you know, as we've been preparing for our events, and there's a really great quote that stood out to me: "Texas Baptist women are fore-minded, fore-handed, and progressive. Expect great things of them, and they will not disappoint you." She also was very passionate about women's causes. She was passionate about immigrants. She had a passion for education and for college students. And so she fundraised to build buildings on college campuses for students to gather and to learn about how to serve and to be involved in missions. Mary Hill Davis was missions. So she prepared a path for the future. She had no idea what it would be like for our lives today, but the quotes that she says are impactful and are meaningful, and influence us in our world today. I do have one last quote, Brandy. In the home, in the social circle, and the wider world of work, the king was calling his daughters into a ripening harvest field, and the sickle that he places in their hands must be sharpened into the keen edge of power. By consecration of life, by communion in prayer, by intensity of activity, and by the perseverance of ceaseless training, Mary Hill Davis passed away November 24, 1934. The following year, at the WMU convention in Houston, Texas, they voted to change the name of the state offering to the Mary Hill Davis offering. What a legacy she has、Great. left for us, Brandy. Don't you wish we could have coffee with her? You know, absolutely. I would love the opportunity to just say thank you, Mary Hill Davis,、mm-hmm. for your life and the impact that you make in Texas missions. Wonderful, amen. Yeah, that deserves. If you didn't know that all the things that the WMU and Mary Hill Davis offering does, that was a good look into that. And the people today, especially the young people today, they 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 seem to be so off because the the core value of what is church and the family has seemed to dissolve in our society. And so they're looking for something to be a part of. And so many years ago, it was church. It was everything in WMU, and now that's just spread out completely. And so it's important to、uh, give to this. And I believe my brother is going to also mention that、uh, we're going to be pick up, picking up an offering、uh, later on for something very similar to that. Let's go ahead and go on. I'm going to ask you to stand and join me as we sing. Would you bless our home and families? Love that conquers fear. Help us learn to love each other 
with a love that constant stays teach us when we face our troubles love's expressed in many ways let's go say hello church let's go visit So that's wrong, right? Ten thirty. Yeah, I'm gonna have to do that. All right, church. I'm gonna ask you to remain standing where you are at. Church, please remain standing where you are at. Let's continue, please. Please hold hands, remain standing where you're at, grab somebody's hand, remain standing where you're at, grab somebody's hand, and let's continue. All together. Let us reach beyond the boundaries of our till the family you have chosen help us learn to love each other with a love that constant stays teach us when we face our troubles love's expressed in many ways God bless you if you could prayerfully get back to your seat because we want to continue to worship the Lord this morning through the giving of our tithes and offerings. I believe Brother Jake, has, you have an announcement to make also in I regards do. to that. I do. All right, so some of y'all got the text or the one call about, um, what, was, what was her name again? I just, no, the, her first name. Her first name. I remember Pablo. Marissa, uh, sorry, I couldn't think if it was Maria or Marissa. Okay, so Marissa and Pablo, uh, they're, they, I know she's a member here. They come here. Uh, she doesn't get to come very often because she works hard, okay, uh, helping provide for her family. Well, they had a house fire, okay, and from what I know, the entire house burned down. So they lost pretty much everything. She's a young woman that has the twins. Yeah, okay, yeah, so a lot of y'all know us by our kids instead of us and I get that because my kids are awesome so she's the one that has the two twin girls so and they're very cool I like them there so um, we have decided to take up a love offering for them we're gonna do that at the end of the service uh, I wanted to make sure a couple handsome guys were back there to do that so I chose Edward and myself so we'll be back there okay um, so just prepare yourselves for that uh, and then, of course, we're taking our offering right now. I think we have also talked about some of our benevolence fund uh, and giving that over to them, too. Not the whole thing, obviously, but, you know, a good chunk of it. So um, I cannot imagine what that's like. That's got to be really tough. So, um, church, I feel like this is what we're meant for, and this is what we're made for, okay? We're, we are, are chosen by God um, to, to, you know, the, lo the love that God gives us, we give that to people, okay? The... I mean, that's what he's commanded us to do is to love and take care of other people. And when the family can't do it, then the church family is next. And then, of course, you know, other things, government and stuff like that. But we're first. OK, so uh, so let's do that. And let's do a good job of that today. OK. All right. Let's pray for our offering. Uh, God, uh, thank you for this day that you've given us, for this time you've given us together. Uh, God, I, I, it's precious to me. I hope it's uh, precious to everyone here and that we, uh, we know how important it is for us and how good it is for us and how good you are for us, God. Uh, thank you for the love you give to us. Uh, thank you for investing in us. Um, when you invest in us, we get to invest in people, God, and, and uh, share your love 
and um, just your grace and your mercy that you have on us. Help us to share that too, God. That's part of it. Uh, we love you. Thank you for this offering time. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, if you can stand, uh, stand up and join me as we begin the worship part of our service. If you like, like to remain seated, then remain seated. It doesn't matter. As long as you sing, that's the part that counts for me. Shackled by a heavy burden Neath a load of guilt and shame Then the hand of Jesus touched me And now I am no longer He touched me, oh, he touched me, and all oh, the joy that floods my soul, something happened, and now I know he touched me and made I've met this blessed Savior Since He's cleansed and made me whole I will never cease to praise Him I'll shout it while eternity He touched me, oh, he touched me, and all oh, the joy that floods my soul, something happened, and now I know he touched me and made Shackled by a heavy burden Neath a load of guilt and shame Then the hand of Jesus touched me And now I am no longer touched me, oh, he touched me, and oh, the joy that floods my soul, something happened, and now I know he touched me and made Please be seated. Let's go ahead and go on with the uh, sermon. Brother Ray, will you please? Yeah, yes. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, let's go ahead and begin with the service. My brother called me up sometime, I think, in the middle of the week, was it, brother? Do you know when that was? Yeah. 
And he asked me if I could go ahead and bring the sermon this morning. Hesitantly, I said yes, uh, trusting that the Lord was going to do something. Now, this is a more of a welcome to my brain, welcome to my mind, and it's a little bit different than what you're used to hearing. Sorry, brother, it's just a little bit different. Uh, but anyway, uh, <clears throat> I don't even have a title. My brother asked, do you have a title? Didn't even work on the title. So uh, my deal is, why is it that we don't talk to him or sit with him when it comes to God? Why is it that we don't do that on a regular basis? Why is it that people, and, and one of the reasons that I think it is, is because f- people feel unworthy. And they feel unworthy to have to be able to talk to God or call to God or whatever for several great variety of reasons. Living here on this earth, living here, this is some of the stuff that we have. Sometimes it has to do with the way what happened to us in the past. For example, we might have some negative childhood experiences growing up. If we grew up in a neglectful or a critical environment that leads to feelings of inadequacy. So when it deals with God, God is your father, but you didn't necessarily have that as a child. That kind of a father is a child. Then when it says that's your father, well, I know the way that my dad was and he never did, you know, pick me up when I was down or this. And so the connection seems to be broken a bit and we think or we see God in that same, in that same way. So that's one of them. The other one is that a person may just generally have low self-esteem. You've seen people like that that we've talked to. In fact, I was telling my brother that I was ta- uh, we, we mentioned somebody, uh, Eileen Martin. She is the head cook, uh, or she was, I don't know if she still is, for at Zephyr Camp. And he asked me, oh, I love Eileen. She's great. She's wonderful. I knew Eileen when she first came to the church I was going to. I was going to West Shore Baptist Church. And that flood in Oasis River, if you remember that, probably about 15, 16 years ago, it had taken over everybody that lived around there, including her. So she came to our church with nothing. She absolutely came with nothing. And she was very down. She was very depressed. She was, she was just very internal. And I just like, wow. I didn't, if, uh, without even knowing th- anything about her, I thought, man, she might have some esteem issues. I don't know. But the way she walked around is that, and with low self-esteem, is that they're, they're believing that they're not deserving of love or success or happiness. So if they believe this about themselves, how can they turn around and reach up to God the creator of everything, well, who am I to do that? But Eileen did, I remember. And so uh, her life has been changed since then, and she's changed many, many lives. If you've ever been to Zephyr Baptist Camp, and she's in the back cooking and loving everybody. In fact, I just made a comment to my brother when we were in the copy machine. Now Eileen is like, brother! She'll come up to you and give you a hug. She wasn't like that in the very beginning. She wasn't like that. It was God that had changed that inside of her and her idea about herself because she aligned herself with what God said. Or are you a perfectionist? What? I see some men going like this. I'm not going to say to who. Uh, Perfectionism. Setting unrealistic standards about yourself or your failing and you fail to meet them and you feel inadequate because you don't meet them. Perfectionists feel like they never are good enough regardless of how much they achieve. They never reach to that. So how can I even talk to God if I can't even do this correctly or what I had set up for myself and now I'm going to talk to God? I can't. No, I don't deserve to. And so that's one of the issues that people deal with all the time. Or social companion, uh, comparison. Constantly comparing yourself or to others, especially in an age of social media. What? Wow. In social media. And that's gotten worse and worse. And those of you that are educators, you see that more and more and more, especially if you've been a teacher for a long time, how much social media affects young kids now. And then it just continues to grow. So they can create feelings of inferiority, seeing others accomplish, they're a better person, they're a better person, they're a better person than me. They look better, they're skinnier than me. What? They're, you know, whatever the point is, but God isn't going to pay attention to me. God should pay attention to them because of the feelings of inadequacy that our children or that we felt growing up. Or maybe there was trauma growing up or abuse. You know, uh, it could be a physical, sexual abuse. Uh, and those, those people feel unworthy due to the shame, due to the guilt, due to the psychological damage caused by this kind of abuse. And they blame themselves 
because I'm the one that did this. This happened to me because I couldn't be quiet or I was fidgeting all the time and I couldn't sit down that this is why I w- this was happening to me. And so why should I go up to God and talk to him and talk to him the way the preacher man says I'm supposed to talk to him, the way the preacher man says or the Sunday school teacher says, no, we can reach out to God. He's not going to listen to me because I know me. I know the way I am. And those are the feelings of people that, that we need to deal with. Or maybe there could be some uh, cultural pressures or society, uh, some other issues, uh, messages that our culture says, this is what beauty is and you don't reach that. This is what a man is and his success needs to be like this. His wealth needs to be like this in order and you don't meet that. And if I don't meet that, why is God even going to pay attention to me or talk to me? And so a lot of times uh, we feel that way or we could have some real mental issues, conditions like depression or anxiety or social anxiety that involve Feelings of unworthiness. I'm not going to go do that because I'm not worthy of that. I'm not, and I, that's what brought up this part of the sermon, brought up the way Eileen was. She would come in wrapped up in a blanket and sit in the back of the church and not talk to anybody because she didn't feel she was worthy of it. Look what happened to my house. Look what happened to my family. And I'm just not, if this happened to me, it's because I'm no good. Because she grew up with those feelings also. And now it became even worse for her. So these, these conditions that can distort the individual, these are the people we're dealing with, and we, you could be dealing with some of this to some extent, which is why we don't sit with God. We love the song in the garden with God. Oh, it's a beautiful song, it's everything, but do you do it? Well, no, not really, because God has so many other things to do to do today. And actually, I don't feel, I, I didn't, you know, do the things that I was supposed to do as a mom, especially the way I was supposed to act to my children. I didn't do that. Or with my husband, or I didn't volunteer for this part at the church. So I, I know that uh, now, you know, I'm going to come up to God. God, will you, this is my issue. Will you help me with that? And God's going to say, really? Yeah. How come you didn't do that? And so we feel those things uh, a lot of times. Uh, or we've got some unresolved guilt and shame. People who carry guilt for past mistakes or feel ashamed for aspects of themselves and so their behavior, and so it develops into a sense of I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy because I messed up. I'm not worthy because I did this. Or I yelled at the kids for no reason at all, and now I'm going to come to God? He gave me those children, and um, no, I'm not going to talk to God about this. And so what we'd like to do is we're still going to come to church. We're still going to sing the hymns. We're still going to come to Bible study. We're still going to deal with that. But having that relationship with God the Father, we kind of don't. Uh, Or another one is conditional love or validation. All right. People who grew up only receiving love or validation or approval when certain conditions are met. And so... If I meet those conditions, do this. I'm always volunteering. I'm always doing this. And if I don't do it, God's not going to listen to me when I come to him in prayer or when I want to sit with him and be calm here or whatever it is that I need because I need to volunteer for that, for that, for that. So I'm earning basically my salvation is what you're thinking or doing because you've always grown up with conditional love. You're only going to get the love if you got the grades and if you cleaned your room and if you acted this way and if you did those kinds of things. All right, so these feelings of unworthiness can be addressed. We can simply address those. And this is why I absolutely love singing songs and break down when I sing songs to the Lord. And sometimes you'll see me and I have to fight it all the time because of that. These are issues that I have, all of them all mixed up. That's what I really do have. Because really, what is stopping you from sitting in the garden with the Lord and talking with the Lord? What is it? Shouldn't this church just be exploding at the seams if you were doing if we were doing that? What is our problem? It's these issues I feel that we need to conquer. So these feelings of I'm not worthy, God does not want to uh, to be bothered by me or I've strayed away this week or yesterday or for a month, I always fall into sin. I don't wake up thinking about God. Or you like being selfish because you like pity parties. Because the pity parties, you're the only one invited to that. 
and it's your party, or you like the pity parties, or I'm not good enough, and the truth is, I will never be good enough. You will never be good enough. So these thoughts keep us away from attempting to reach out to God, to sit with God, to be with God. This is you trying, but this is you trying to do something that God already did for you. He already did it. He already conquered that. Okay, so God did this. So in the New Testament, there are many individuals or groups that requested even miracles from Jesus and God. You see? So let me give you an example. In Matthew chapter 8, the centurion, a Roman soldier centurion, asked Jesus to heal his servant. Well, we all know that the centurions, the, the, the Roman soldiers, they didn't like the Jews. They could do what they wanted to do with the Jews, and the Jews were oppressed by these soldiers. Yet this man still felt like everything he was seeing about Jesus, that Jesus had compassion and love beyond anything he ever seen. And so he went up to Jesus and said, will you heal my servant? Just say the word because I know that the power will go over there. He had, I don't want to say the, the, the drive, the guts really, to go and walk up to Jesus. Why don't you? Why don't you? Remember Jarius? He was a synagogue leader. And he asked Jesus to heal his dying daughter. That's in Mark chapter 5, verse 22. Uh, so that, that's, what he, that's what he did. And so in this case right here, once again, remember the Pharisees, the way they acted? Sadducees, the way they acted? And that it was just about their way? Yet they saw something about Jesus that was different. They didn't have to change, accept Jesus Christ, go to church every Sunday. They, didn't, they had issues in their lives, just like you have issues in your life, just like I have issues in my life. Yet they still went up to the Lord and said, can you heal my daughter? Will you heal my daughter, please? How about the woman with the issue of blood? The woman with the issue of blood in Mark chapter 5. The woman with the issue of blood, she didn't verbally request a miracle, but she said to herself, this man is different. Not touch his garment, but touch the very hem of his garment. And this is all I need. This is all I need to do. Amen. You don't think that she grew up her whole life? What did I do that I have this issue of blood? Does God hate me? What did I do wrong in my life? And perhaps maybe she felt that way and was that way. It didn't matter. She still had the drive, the need overcame that and said, Jesus is there to heal and says that he loves me and he's walking around with all those sinners. If I just touch the hem of his garden, gar uh, garment, all right? And then, of course, there was uh, Bartimaeus in Mark chapter 10. He cried out to Jesus, restore my sight. What happened? Did he do something dumb and fell off the edge of a house and became blind? So God's not going to heal me. I was stupid, or I was drunk, and I became blind because I fell down and hurt myself. So why am I going to come to God and ask him to heal me? Those are the thoughts that we have that society has built inside of us. What I'm trying to share with you is that don't have those thoughts because the Bible doesn't say that. You want to see what truth is and what a lie is? Don't believe yourself because you know that you're a liar. Believe what the truth says, what the Bible says about God. And then there's Mary and Martha who did everything for the Lord. And they still asked him, can you bring Lazarus back? So they still did, even though they did everything. So no, I'm not going to ask the Lord. Yes, I do take care of this. I do take care of these people. And I, I do give at the church. I do give my time to the church. And I spread the gospel over here. But I'm not going to ask the Lord about it because of it. No, Mary and Martha still did. So you can talk to the Lord about what your deep needs are. We can. So these, are feeling, these feelings are, I'm not worthy. God does not want to be bothered by me. I have strayed away. I was fallen to sin. I don't wake up thinking about God. I like being selfish. Again, the pity parties. Or I'm not good enough and I will never be good enough. But look at each of those requesters. The centurion. Why would Jesus want to do a request that I'm asking him if I'm the oppressor to his people. 
But did Jesus do it? Yes, he did. All right. So Jairus at the synagogue leader, why would he, he knows that he's against, I'm in those meetings against Jesus. That's where I am. But there's something about him and I'm going to go ask him. And Jesus knows everything. So he knows the way Jairus is. And he still did it. He still did it. It's not about how good you are. It's not about how good you've got to be. It never was. It's about Jesus. It is about Jesus. So these thoughts that we have keep us away from, uh, from attempting to reach out to God, to sit with him, to be with him, to talk with him. Those are your thoughts. And what we need to do is we need to take those thoughts captive and get rid of them. And, and, and it's simple to do that. You don't like the TV show you're watching? There. Do you sit there for an hour thinking about the TV show that you were watching that you hated that you changed the channel on? No. You just change the channel and boom, it's done. That's all you need to do. And every time it comes up, just no, no I gave that. This is what it means to give it to Jesus. It says, oh, you have all that stress? Give it to Jesus. That's right. You click the button to give it to Jesus, to change the channel. I'm going I'm to trust the Lord, and that's it. I'm going to let it rest. So I'm taking this, and I'm going to place it here at the feet of Jesus. That's the way you give it to Jesus. Oh, you can't make your rent this week, and you can't make that bill, and you're, you've got this high anxiety or whatever the deal. Brother, you need to give it to Jesus. How do you give it to Jesus? It's your thoughts. It's your mind. When they start to take over, when you're going to sleep, when you're trying to rest and all you can do is just think about that stress, think about what's going to happen, think about that. No. Change the channel. I'm taking that off and I'm going to lay it at the feet of Jesus. That's what it means. Give it to Jesus. And I'm not going to pick it up. I, I gave it to you, Jesus, but I'm going to, you know what? Hold on one second. Let me, let me put that back on right here. So when I go to sleep now, I'm going to be thinking about this the whole time. How are you going to get rest? How are you going to do it? How are you resting? Yes, resting in Jesus. And that, what? That's what it means. Take captive of those thoughts. And so that's how we're able to build anxiety. All right? But what is it that you need? You need help with anxiety? Uh, are you requesting healing? What are your needs? Is it strength that you need? Strength for today? Strength for work? Strength for whatever it is. Asking the Lord. Talk to the Lord about it. Don't listen to yourself. Well, I would have asked last week because I was more involved with church membership and I prayed a few more times last week than I did now. So, uh, yeah, I, I could have asked that last week, but not now. Where are you getting that from? That, that's, that's back on, on ourselves. And I said, I'm revealing about me. I'm talking about me this whole time. But this is... Anyway, I want to share with you something else. Mark chapter 5, verse 1. Jesus restores a possessed man. And so, verse 5 uh, is where I'm going to go. No, 1. Sorry, sorry, 1. They went across the lake to the region of... Brother, how do you say that word? Jere, jere, go ahead. I'll trust you. Is it up there? Yes. Anybody want to share it with me? What? Garrisonis? Okay, all right. Then we'll go with that Garrisonis, according to my brother. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore. That means at the cemetery, he had been bound by that person, that person, that person, that person. And it didn't bind him. It's okay, we got better chains, we got better ways to bind him, and we're going to bind him and leave him in the cemetery over there. Nope, that broke through. All right, you, 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 and all of us are going to get on top of him, and we're going to bind him. That's what we're going to do, and keep him in there in the cemetery. All right? So... <clears throat> the man lived in the tombs and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons from his feet. No one strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tubes and the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. 
Verse uh, 6, when, Jesus, when, when he saw Jesus come from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? In God's name, don't torture me. Verse 8, For Jesus had said unto him, Come out of this man, you impure spirit. Number 9, Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion which means thousands upon thousands upon thousands. He replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send him out of the area. Verse 11, a large herd of pigs were feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs. Allow us to go to them. He gave them permission and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town at the countryside. And the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had just happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave the region. Please leave. Just, just leave. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him, begging him. Master, I want to go with you. I need to go with you. This, this man who had been possessed for this long, taken over by these spirits for this long, wanted to go with Jesus. Jesus did not let him, but said, go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he had mercy for you. And so the man went away and began to tell how much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were amazed. What am I trying to say here? Even the demons... The demons being demons requested from Jesus. Send me into the pigs. They requested. What's wrong with you? Nothing compared to those demons. And not one demon, two demons, three demons, but legions of demons. And all the evilness that they are. They had a request to Jesus. And we're afraid. We're afraid to. And Jesus honored that request and put him in the pigs. Do you see who you serve? Don't think about that little guy that's inside here. Think about what, what the Bible says about, the, about Jesus. And so the Bible presents other reasons why God reaches out to the community. I'm sorry, I'm looking through my notes. Yes, so still, what I'm saying is God honored his, that demons, those demons and their request. So the Bible presents several key reasons why God reacts and acts out like this with humanity. His desire that everybody can agree on is a relationship with you. That's what his desire is. So God desires for a relationship. So the creation, it was the creation was for fellowship. The Bible teaches us that God created humans in his image to have a relationship with them. In the Garden of Eden, God walked with Adam and Eve, symbolizing his desire to be close in fellowship with humanity. God also made covenants with people. Throughout the Bible, God reaches out to individuals and nations, establishing covenants to draw them into relationship with God. So he spoke to Abraham, to Noah, to David, all of them. He initiated agreements that if you do, the, why? It was to draw them and his people to him. That's what God wants. Don't believe that because I didn't do this and didn't do that or do this or because, you know, God doesn't No, this is me, lonely me, and this bad stuff happened to me. And, and so God wouldn't even look at me. No, God is always reaching out to you. He, he's already done that. God's love for humanity again, John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. God's actions throughout the entire Bible is him reaching out 
to you for that relationship. It's not you, if I do this, I'll be closer to God. No, 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 that's not, that's, not, that's not what he's looking for. He's just looking for that relationship with you. So God's compassion in the book of Psalms, in Psalm 145, God's compassionate nature is highlighted. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion to all that he has made. So why am I, shoulders bent, thinking I'm no good, God doesn't love me, nobody loves me, and all this stuff, when the Bible says that, once again, that's you. That's you. Change the channel. Because the Bible, which is truth, because you're a liar, the Bible, which is truth, says this is what God says. Every single time, this is who God is. This is who he is and what he wants. So he wants to offer redemption from sin. The fall during Adam and Eve, Eve's sin, Adam and Eve's sin in the garden, humanity became separated from God. This is in Genesis 3. The separation caused spiritual death and brokenness. But the Bible, truth again, describes how God continuously reaches out to rescue humanity and its consequences from sin since the very beginning. Since the very beginning. The woman's heel will strike the head of the snake. Since the very beginning, God had done that. So then there's Jesus, the Savior, central to the entire Bible. It's God sending his son Jesus to save the people from their sin, to restore their relationship with him through Jesus' life, because it was perfect. His death, because he was sin at that moment. All of sin was on him, and his resurrection, because he was God. Resurrection. God offers forgiveness, and God offers reconciliation because nothing else matters. So what is it that we don't feel like we can turn to God when he already did all of this for you, did all of this for me? So in Romans 5, chapter 8, it says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were yet still sinners, Christ died. Well, brother, I was saved, and now that I know the difference between right and wrong, and I still do wrong, uh, but I understand that. No, 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 you don't understand. God loved you while you were still yet a sinner. While that chasmic separation between you and God, he still loved you that he sent his son. So verse 9 says, since we now have been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, because we were separated, we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but We also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. You know, all the time we always talk about, yes, because I'm saved. Jesus saved me. You're right. You're right. You're right. He saved you. He saved me. I'm going into heaven. But right now we have the chance to have this reconciliation with God. Right now at this moment in your life, you have this now. We have that opportunity to be with God in that sense. So this act of reaching uh, out through Jesus is seen in the ultimate act of love and redemption. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in his mercy, made us alive with Christ even though we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. So that's it. Also, there's also a revelation a little bit of God's character. God reaches out to humanity to reveal his nature, to reveal his holiness because you were no good, dead, transgression you were, but he is holy And he is rich in mercy. And in order for us to see his great mercy, those demons need to be cast out into the pigs. You, me, I needed to be saved in order for me to recognize that. 
his mercy. So through scripture, prophets, ultimately through Jesus, God made himself known. Hebrews 1 explains that while God spoke through the prophets in the past, he has now fully. How do you put God in the word fully? How do you encapsulate fully? So again, through the prophets, through scripture, prophets, and ultimately through Jesus, God makes himself known. Hebrews 1, 1 through 2 explains that while God spoke through the prophets in the past, he has now fully, God, God has revealed himself fully, revealed himself through his son Jesus. So let's talk about, you know, so in that, we have guidance and instruction. God reaches out to provide moral guidance and wisdom for living through his laws, commandments, and teaching. God offers humanity a way to live according to his will. Also, he has a call for his people. For his people, there is a purpose for his people. It's calling to serve and reflect God's image. What we were seeing about Mary Hill Davis and the offering. The Bible emphasizes that God calls individuals to serve him and reflect his image in the world. And a good example of that is the Great Commission. In the Great Commission, Jesus calls his followers to go and make disciples of all nations, spreading God's message of love and salvation. God has a plan for each person. Each individual person, God has a plan. Scriptures like in Jeremiah 29, 11 highlight that God has a purpose and a plan for each person's life. The scripture says, for I know the plans I have for you. You see that? You weren't just developed to go wandering through this world. But I don't don't know, calling God a liar? The Bible is truth. And the truth says, the truth says very clearly It says, for I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope for the future. That's that's it right there. You don't think that the man that was tied up at the cemetery and had the demon possessions that were going on with him, like, why me? If he could even speak to himself in all the clatter of the thousands of demons, legion that were inside of him, Why, why me? Why me? What was up? And he wanted to follow Jesus. You could see where his heart was. But why did he get, you know why? Because once this happened and he was freed and all those people became afraid of Jesus, you know what? Get on your boat and go. Long time later, Jesus comes back to the same place and everybody was hailing him and loving him. And we want to make you our king. That's what we want to do. That's what we want to do. It was what those people, the ones who didn't want Jesus around. But you know what changed their mind? The demon-possessed guy. He walked out and told him, Jesus did this to me. You remember me? You remember me? Jesus did this. No, he's not like that. Why would he have compassion for me? Why would he have done that for me? And now that whole region is coming to Jesus. And so, is there a purpose in your life? Yes, there is. And the difficulties that we go through, yes. All right? So, God does have a plan for each purpose. So, his idea, restoration restoration was through Jesus. In the New Testament, God's plan is not just to save individuals. It's not just to save, like I told you earlier, like, I am saved. Thank you, Lord, I'm saved. I'm going into heaven. No, but it's to restore the entire creation which had been afflicted by sin. Revelation to, uh, 21, uh, uh, verses 1 through 5, speaks of the future where God will make all things new, wipe away every tear, and dwell with his people forever. And so in heaven, you remember when you had your five year old son, daughter, four year old son, daughter, nephew, whoever it was that was crying? And you had compassion on him. Maybe it was his birthday and nobody came. Nine-year-old boy, girl. And just started crying. And there you are hugging him with such great, my son is so hurt, wiping away. 
that's what you're doing. And you're feeling the pain of your child for whatever it is. I had a niece who, who, who was healed by God, but the cancer that she went through. I, I, I mean, it's just, it's incredible that feeling of overwhelmed compassion that we have for our children. So the Bible says in Revelation 21, 1 through 5, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from the heaven, and God prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them once again. He will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will will be with them and their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He who is seated on the throne said, I'm making everything new. Then he said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and they are true. So we have that gift from God. But that's because we can't have that because we're in our earthly bodies. But the Holy Spirit and, a, and, a, and, and, and learning and being with God and talking with God and being a part of that, he allows that. Why are we not doing it? We need to stop listening to ourselves the Bible portrays God as actively, actively reaching out to humanity because of his love, his desire for his relationship plan for redemption. The purpose of each individual, that's why. His ultimate goal is to reconcile people back to himself, to restore them from sin and offer eternal life through Jesus Christ. So don't listen to yourself. Listen to what the Bible says about God. Believe and reach out no matter what your circumstances are because when you were deep into sin, he still was there for you. Centurion causing pain to his people, God still listened to him. Legion with all the demons, God still listened to him. We're free. We are God's people. This is who we are. So let's go ahead and, and go on with uh, Kimberly. So church, I want you to stand and join me. And what we're going to do is we're going to worship the Lord through music again. cross Lord thank you for the price you paid bearing all my sin and shame in love you came and gave amazing grace thank you for this love Lord Thank you for the nail-pierced hands. Wash me in your cleansing flow. Now all I know is your forgiveness and embrace. Worthy is the Lamb seated on the throne crown you now with many crowns you reign victorious high and lift it up Jesus Son of God the treasure of heaven crucified. Worthy is the Lamb. Let's be 
begin to worship. You know these words. Let's begin to thank the Lord and worship Him. Before the cross, Lord, thank You for the price You paid, bearing all my sin and shame. In love You came and gave a name. you for this love, Lord. Thank you for the nail hands. Wash me in your cleansing flow. Now all I know is your forgiveness and embrace. Worthy is the Lamb. With many crowns, you reign victorious. High and lifted up, Jesus, Son of God, the treasure of heaven, crucified. Worthy is the Lamb, worthy is the Lamb, worthy is the Lamb, seated on the throne, crown you now with many crowns you reign victorious high and lifted up Jesus Son of God the treasure of heaven crucified Worthy is the Lamb, worthy is the Lamb, worthy is the Lamb, worthy is the Lamb. Father, we thank you so much for this plan that even before when we were born, Lord, you had already set this plan into motion. We thank you for the death and that you chose Jesus to ultimately die for me, for each and every one of us here, Lord. And Father, may we recognize it's not just about salvation, but that is, that is incredibly it, Lord, but it's about reconciliation. Give us the strength, Lord, not to listen to ourselves and what we think about the way we are and who we are, but that we'll be able to think of sound doctrine of what your word says, what truth says, Lord, about what you are, what you are doing in our lives, and how that you're always looking for us, Lord. Thank you for the cross. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you, church.